what is it? Um, this, you know, just a cloud here about the different kinds of things. And I think, you know, what is it, what isn't it? Um, we are a global marketplace. So, you know, you see Katrina in there and you see education and you see bank and you see different issues and you see Nike. We really want to be a platform, really an infrastructure that is essential for the smooth functioning of global philanthropy. Um, so we view ourselves as a platform, which means we have a lot of different things going on. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reason, as I mentioned, when Dennis and Mari founded Global Giving, we really wanted to create a place where anybody who had a great idea and some bit of infrastructure to help implement it could access capital in the United States. And we now have a sister organization in the UK. Um, but it's really providing access to these social entrepreneurs and idea generators and finding ways for them to, um, to get funds that they couldn't have otherwise. So I'm just going to play this quick um, public service announcement video. This is, this, is what, this is one of the reasons I love my job. So this was done for us pro bono by a guy who won a Director's Guild Award. Um, he made a really bad movie. What was it? Um, I'll have to go back and remember. But this guy likes made real movies, and he actually made Hoosiers. I know there are some basketball fans at Georgia Tech. Um, so the director who made this is that guy. So I got to go watch this thing being filmed in a warehouse in LA in the middle of the night. That, that's how we're trying to describe global giving in one 30-second <laughs> spot. So let me tell you, I sort of talked about blood, sweat, and tears. Let me tell you a little bit about where we are today. Um, as of, these, the, the data is a little bit old, but um, as of a, about a month or so ago, we had about 30, a little over $30.5 million of donations come through the global giving platform, either through the website or through checks or other kind of contributions from companies. Um, and when I say that 30 and a half million, that's specifically to projects that are posted on our website. And I'm going to go through in detail how that works. 3,000 organizations around the world, or 3,000 projects, I should say, run by over 1,000 organizations have received funding. And that money has come from 110, it's actually now about 113,000 donors. So Global Giving is very much made for the $10 donor, the $50 donor, um, and we feel as though if you're a $10 donor or a $50 donor, you should have as much information about where your money's going, whether it's going to you know, the Women's Organization Against Domestic Violence in Decatur or the Women's Domestic Violence Organization in Zimbabwe. Um, that there should be some sense of what's going on. Um, so we also work with really cool companies. And this is mostly what I do, which makes it fun to have my job. OK, a um, couple of hypotheses. I mentioned sort of the, the spark behind global giving as far as bottom-up solutions versus top-down solutions. But there are a couple of hypotheses that we sort of live by. One is the notion of the wisdom of the crowds. Anybody familiar with this? Yes? Say, tell us. Talk loud. There's no mic. <laughs> Perfect. So global giving is very much built on the notion that if lots of people who aren't experts are provided with a lot of, with information that they can evaluate about which organizations are doing what, that they're likely to make as good of decisions, if not better, than a group of small experts in development in choosing the best solutions. And so the concept of the marketplace. Part of that is the importance of data and the importance of feedback loops. And so what, I'll show you a couple of examples of how we're trying to get unique 
um, approach it, to implement unique approaches to getting feedback about what's actually happening in communities. Traditionally, when large philanthropic con contributions are made overseas, or even here in the U.S., you know, foundations, no offense to the foundations in the room, um, require a lot of reporting and evaluation and monitoring and impact assessment. And all that stuff's good, but it's really an evolving field in philanthropy. People are trying to figure out how to make good assessments about what's working and what's not without causing so much of a burden on nonprofits that they're spending all their time doing gathering of data and reporting. And the technologies that are out there today make it much, much more possible to gather that kind of information in a, in a sort of thin layer kind of way rather than a really uh, onerous way. So we're experimenting with how to get that kind of feedback. Um, we'd like to say that we'd rather be the Yelp of assessment than the Michelin guide of assessment. So we're looking for crowdsourcing and, um, you know, again, this sort of crowd involvement in the feedback loops rather than um, necessarily the experts. Although we do consult with experts. So what do we do? We provide a, a whole set of tools for these social entrepreneurs to raise money and for donors as well. So um, this is a sh screenshot of our web uh, homepage about a month ago. Um, just gives you a sense if you haven't been there, you can look up projects by theme or topic and then by country. So we have right now about a thousand projects in about 75 countries that are listed on the website. And this is a good example, 50 elementary scholarships for Liberian children. I get go into detail on this. And this is a project page. So the project page, you can see, has a lot of information that's consistent with what I was saying about how we're set up. It's got very specific, it's hard to read, but the, every project has very specific donation options. So it might say, you know, for $15, it's gonna pay for one girl's uh, school uniform for a year. It might be, um, it is impossible to read. It might buy a backpack for somebody. It might be three vaccinations in a particular village in a, in a part of the world. It could be, you know, a micro, a uh, hundred dollars, you know, provides a micro loan for one um, entrepreneur somewhere. Was anybody here for the Muhammad Yunus talk? So you know all about my, you're experts on microfinance now. Um, in addition to the detail on the project, you can see that there's information about how many people have given and how many dollars have been raised. This is, again, trying to provide information for decision making, so creating sort of trust cues so that when people go and look at a project, they can say, oh, well, I can see that on this one, they've raised $24,000 from 224 people. 224 people think it's a decent project. It probably doesn't completely suck. Um, you know, so we're trying to put that kind of information out there. And then there's a lot of sharing. You know, you can put it on your Facebook and all that stuff. We have the ubiquitous Facebook like button. Um, and try to provide as much information. What you can't see, but you can see if you go to the site, is that every project, and we've actually changed these project pages, has just a tremendous amount of information. It has what's the project going to do, where is it, who's running it, it has pictures, it has updates, just a tremendous amount of information. And that's all provided by the organization doing the work on the ground. Oh, that would have helped, wouldn't it? Okay. So t other tools. There's two ways that, can, that um, the platform can be used for fundraising. The one on the left is more for the organization itself. So this is a screenshot of one of our project organizations. They've taken this widget from their project on global giving and put it on their homepage. They don't, this is, this is an organization that do, is not a U.S. charity. And so part of what Global Giving is doing is making it possible for non-U.S. charities to raise charitable money in the United States. We go through a very extensive vetting process for each of these organizations that post a project. So these guys right now, the only way they're going to be able to get you know, tax deductible money from United States donors is by going through Global Giving. So they're taking a widget off of our site for their project, putting it there. And the one on the right is a fundraiser. So the site has tools for, I mean, you all have raised funds, you told me initially. Um, so the site has tools to set up fundraisers. Um, and in this case, this one is 
um, a running team that was raising money for the girl effect, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. OK, this is kind of boring. The foundation people didn't think it was boring today, but you guys probably think it's boring. Um, this is, but it, it's actually kind of cool, because what happens is every time somebody makes a donation to your project, if you're the project leader, you get a ping, an email, or however you want it, that says, hey, somebody made a donation to your project. And you can go back, and this is a, a console that we have, so even if you're in some remote part of the world, you know exactly how many donations have been made to, to this particular project, in what time frame you can thank people immediately through the site. Um, and you can then expect, um, know how much money to expect to receive in the next disbursement. We send money to about 95 countries every month, um, to 600 project organizations in 95 countries every month. OK, um, back to the feedback loops. So every part of the deal for being a project on global giving is you have to agree to post an update once a quarter. And so again, that's all done through the site. Um, this is an example of a note that uh, an organization that I'll talk about in a minute posted. And again, just to reiterate the, the feedback, we make it possible for people who read the comments to say, oh, I found this valuable, and to make comments if they want to. They're not, I didn't show them on the screenshot, but the idea is to have more of a conversation. So that if I post an update, and you're the donor who reads it, and you think it's baloney, you can comment about that. Or if you have a follow-up question, and there's you know, more interaction going on. OK. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, we're trying to use some new ways of assessing impact. So the, to start on the right side, um, has anybody ever seen the chart with the red dots before? Look at all familiar? Yes, she's saying yes. You know what it is? Yeah, it's uh, look up in your area like what, what, what Right, so you probably all couldn't hear. You can look up in your area. So this is a, this is a map of Atlanta. And the red dots show the number of violent attacks in those parts of Atlanta during the period May 2009 to December 2009. And these sorts of systems um, are all, you know, all over the place now. And we have one in DC. The reason I show it is because what, what they're testing through this is that you know, all of this data exists. It's in police records. Some newspapers post it, but people don't go there. They don't read it. And so, but the technology exists to map it now easily. And in this case, it's like, well, people can just get a quick look and get a sense for what's going on in their community. And so we're trying to take that same concept and consumer demand, if you will, and apply it to what's happening in the areas where we have projects that are being implemented. So the thing on the left is an experiment that we did recently in Kibera, which is the largest slum in Kenya outside of Nairobi, or connected to Nairobi, where we said, OK, what are, what are the things that your community needs the most? A bridge, a pump, a clinic. And then we can map it, and show all this, but then we can map it similar to the data you have there about exactly where are people saying they need things. There's also a similar technology that um, one of our colleagues is using. You know, everyone's like implementing water pumps all over the place. Do you guys, you know, see all this, you know, charity water and build a well and all these other water, 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 which is important. But what's what people are finding now is, and there's play pumps. You know, the one where the kids go around, little merry-go-round thing, and it generates power and that gets water going. What people are finding is that. These things get implemented, and within a year, they're broken. And so they just get abandoned. And so there are, so somebody might be coming to Global Giving saying, I'm paying $100 to put in a pump in some village. But a year later, it's broken. So now a group called water.org is using t this kind of technology to have people text message information about broken pumps. So that instead of just, I'm paying $100 for a new pump, there can be follow-up on the ones that are out there so that they're actually being used. So these are the kinds of tech, you know, sort of, as I mentioned, utilizing the fact that most Kenyans have cell phones. They don't necessarily have internet. 
So why not use the technology that they're using? OK, a couple of examples of the kinds of organizations that are just kind of fun. Um, this first one is pretty awesome. It's, um, I had the chance to visit it last summer in Tanzania. Um, it's called Hero Rats. And this is a guy who um, figured out that he could train rats to sniff out landmines. Um, and now he's found that he could train the rats to sniff, t sniff um, swab, swabs from your cheek to sniff out TB. Because people in poor neighborhoods don't go to the clinic and get checked. So they can literally go around and gather up swabs in neighborhoods, put them in these um, test tubes. I've actually seen this. And the rats literally like can figure out which, which of the specimens people have TB or not. It's pretty amazing. Um, so this is a guy who um, was an Ashoka fellow. Ashoka is a social entrepreneurship organization. And we got connected to him. He had this project on the website and kind of wasn't doing much. I mean, you know, raise a little bit of money here and there. He's Belgian. He has some access to money. He works out of a university in Tanzania. Um, but Nick Kristof, who writes for the New York Times, anybody read Nick Kristof? If you want to be a social entrepreneur, you should read Nick Kristof. He is one of the best journalists out there for telling the truth. Just my opinion. Um, so Nick Kristof writes for the New York Times. And he sends us an email and says, you know, what project should I tell people to give as a donation in honor of their father on Father's Day rather than buying him a tie? And we're, he's like, I like that rat one. We're like, yes, hero rats. So Nick Kristof writes this article right before Father's Day. Also, his father passed away like the week before Father's Day. So he writes this emotional article about his father. And then he goes on to say how, like, who needs another tie? Make a donation to this Hero Rats project on global giving and send a card to your dad. Because then he gets a macho you know, TB and landmine sniffing rat for his Father's Day gift and not a stupid tie you know, with like windmills on it. Two weeks later, $200,000. $200,000. So the power of the media in philanthropy is huge. I'm going to give you some other examples of that. And the cool thing is that update I showed you, these guys were awesome. Because they it was like we gave them a heads up. So they, like, they knew it was coming. And then they started sending updates out. So you know we had, I think, 3,000 people gave in the course of two weeks around Father's Day. But they were posting updates like every three or four days. So everybody who had given would get an update. Some people gave twice in the course of two weeks. It was really phenomenal. Um, and so every so often, great things happen to really good projects. This is another one, smaller scale. This is a local project in DC. It's like shooting back. Some of you might be familiar with that. It's called Critical Exposure. Works with inner city kids, teaches them digital photography, but also uses the photography as a way to um, advocate for change in the public schools. And so this, these guys were down the hall from us in our office in DC. And we had a challenge, a sort of a, a fundraising challenge for, um, for US focused organizations, they really had never raised money before. You know, it's one thing to like be in school and you know, get 10 of your friends to give. But for these guys who had just started this organization, they didn't really have a donor database. But they knew they had friends and they had Facebook fans and whatever. So they used our little ch um, fundraising challenge as a way to test out whether or not their networks had network effects. You guys probably read and talk about network effects, right? So I have 10 friends, they have 10 friends, et cetera. So three weeks later, they had 500 new donors and $20,000, and they won the challenge. And so it's just a couple of examples of how you just kind of never know. And we often find with organizations outside of the US, they think they don't have any networks. But once they start organizing and asking people to use the tools, they're pretty amazed by how many networks, in fact, they have. So the question then becomes, well, does manna fall from heaven for everyone? Right? I mean, like the hero rats. Everybody doesn't, it sort of goes back to the if we build it, they will come theory. Because the hero rats is a little bit like that. It's like, oh, we put our project on it. We got $200,000. That doesn't happen to everybody. So global giving does a lot. And this is kind of what I spend a lot of my time doing to try to drive donors to the website. Because as we all agreed, we don't wake up in the morning and just decide to go look for a website to give to some remote place. Um, so we do 
what any e-commerce business would do. We do uh, Google AdWords for paid search. We make sure our website, you know, has good search engine optimization. We do outreach to the media. We have 17,000 Twitter followers. We have, you know, Facebook page. We do all sorts of um, sort of traditional media to drive donors. In addition to that, we work with special opportunities. So I talked about Nick Kristoff, pretty powerful, another powerful media person. Um, Oprah Winfrey, you may recognize her. She did two, two stories last year on women and girls. And as part of that, she created a registry on her website, on Oprah.com, which is sort of like a little mini global giving, actually. It was about 15 projects, I think, maybe 20 projects. They were all women and girl related. And so we had three, they called us and they said, well, we have, you want to put some projects on this? We're like, yeah. So they took three projects, one in Uganda, one in Guatemala, and one in Afghanistan. And she talked about the registry. She asked people to go and see if they were interested in giving. And um, we had to get our servers all toned up because they have all these, you know, we're going to have two million hits in five minutes. It was not two million hits in five minutes. But we did end up having three, those three projects receive about 30, 30 or 40 thousand dollars each just through being featured on this page with 20 other projects. So we look, we we actively look for opportunities like this to expose our projects to the media. We also work with companies on employee giving. So you guys are all familiar with the United Way campaign, right? So most, many companies are um, kind of shifting away from just the traditional United Way campaign to more open employee giving programs. And in the case of Nike, they actually never had a United Way campaign. What's happened just historically is United Way is mostly a US set of programs. So the whole notion of I work somewhere and my employer might match what I'm giving or they're going to encourage me to give, that's a sort of uniquely American thing. But now we have all these multinational kind of organizations and they have people in Belgium and UK and all over the place, right? Asia. So they wanted one program for everybody. So we built them a version of global giving that sits inside their employee intranet. And so all the global giving projects and, and then projects and organizations that Nike employees recommend are available to their employees to give to. And Nike matches all of their donations. Interestingly, they don't just match them one for one. They actually give them like a little gift voucher so they can match the same. So if they give to, uh, they're mostly in Portland, Oregon. So if they give to Oregon State, they're not a rifle. They're in a totally different part of the world in conference. Um, then they can say, I want my match to go to Oregon State, or they can go and find another project and give the matching money to the, a different project. So we built the website, we run the website, we handle um, the vetting of new organizations that their employees want to give to. And because of this, again, those projects that have come on the site are receiving money from Nike employees. There's no way they would have reached Nike employees before. So part of our job is to get them exposed. So we also work on um, sort of cause marketing campaigns. So a good example of this is one that just finished up that we did with Neutrogena. Anybody ever bought grapefruit body wash? Come on, women, put your hands up. <laughs> okay, so last month in a back to school kind of campaign, um, Neutrogena came to us and they said, actually it was their PR firm, came to us and they said, um, so Neutrogena wants to do this campaign where um, for every bottle of grapefruit body wash or cleanser, they're giving a dollar and they want three different programs to receive the money. And we love your platform and you guys get social media, so let's do, we would like to do this with you. So we um, worked with them to identify three projects. One was um, Girls Education in Senegal. One was, what was the other one? Haiti Relief. And one was uh, assessing damage to wildlife, to wildlife, what do you call them? Dolphins and whales, mammals, in uh, the Gulf <laughs> after Hurricane Katrina. Now I know this third one sounds a little random. And you can see that 
the spokespeople for these products are Vanessa Hudgens and Hayden Pantier. So does anyone have any idea why we might be looking at dolphins and whales in the Gulf Coast? Think about movies Hayden might have been in. Anyone? OK, Hayden was in a movie called The Cove, which was, briefly, which was about um, whale hunters and dolphin hunters in Japan. It was, it was a pretty intense movie. So she became very interested in this issue of saving the dolphins. So she asked us to get her favorite charity up onto Global Giving so that it could be the recipient of part of this program. Which, you know, sounds kind of sketch, but in reality, there's nothing wrong with it, right? I mean, it's a good cause. She's their spokesperson. And what they know is that those three issues, disaster relief, girls' education, and the environment, um, or animals, matter to their consumers, the people who buy Neutrogena products. So for a month, a dollar went to every project. They had a way on Facebook that you could vote for which of those three projects you thought you'd prefer the money to go to. Hayden's project lost big time, just for the record. Um, <laughs> but uh, they raised $200,000. In fact, they just put out a press release yesterday. So in that way, you know, global giving is really embracing the corporate world, even though I am a corporate refugee. You know, we kind of view it as these companies are trying to do better in the world and to use the power of their brands and their marketing dollars to have some positive impact. I got, we got some pretty interesting letters from people when we announced this program. Um, just for those of you who are planning to be social entrepreneurs, um, got some interesting letters from people saying, you know, it was bad that we were working with Neutrogena because they're a cosmetics company and they're destroying young women's self-esteem. Um, and not only that, but they have chemicals in all of these products that are massively bad for the environment and they might cause cancer. And all of that's probably got some truth to it. Um, so I had spent some time responding to these letters about, you know, we're all on a, we're all on a journey to be better citizens of the planet. Um, and um, I just share that with you because I think even in the do-gooder world, nobody's ever, you know, you can't get 100% of the votes all the time. <laughs> so this is, a, this is kind of fun. They did a, a special little mini version of Made on MTV. I know you guys know what that is. I had no idea before we did this. Okay, this is one of the fun ones, um, the girl effect. I'm going to actually show you a short video and then tell you what, what it's all about. Anybody seen the girl effect video? Couple of people. Okay. Hopefully it will work this time, right, John?
So, pretty cool, huh? So, or you might think it's really bad. Uh, so we were pretty excited, actually, to work with the Nike Foundation on this. Um, so after you watch the video on the Girl Effect website, actually before, there's a like do something about this link, um, and that ends up at Global Giving. And so what we've done is we have about nine or ten projects uh, that are focused on girls in developing countries that are also recipients of Nike Foundation grants. Um, and I will tell you that the demographics, so the average donor to Global Giving is like 40-year-old woman, highly educated, lives in a major city. Um, but for this program, it's way younger, even more female, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and it's really, it really has kind of gone viral. I mean, so we've had $350,000 or something. And they're launching Girl Effect 2, hopefully, later this month. Um, and the call to action is going to be a mobile giving option. So, you know, text blank. Text girl to blank, blank, blank. I think it's 55055 five, or something. Anyway, I will send that around because <laughs> um, it's actually live. We've set that up. So that's a pretty cool thing. We like doing that. Best job in the world. Um, another example of, and these are all just things, ways that we leverage that sort of basic website platform to, to get more people involved in philanthropy. So we talked about the notion of crowdsourcing of information and voting. So moving from crowdsourcing to crowdfunding, um, and what that means is we, we run challenges, giving challenges at various times on the site. This one we did with Athletes for Hope, which works with athletes, you know, big name athletes like Steve Nash and sort of regular old athletes that probably no one's ever heard of that play on like a women's soccer team. Um, and they put either their charities that they were involved with or they adopted one of the projects on Global Giving, and we ran a three-week campaign where they were all competing for prize money, essentially. So the projects that got the most donors and the most dollars got were competing for like $40,000 of prize money. Um, so Steve Nash won. At the, literally like at midnight on the last night, some $5,000 donation came in, which seemed a little bit weird to me. Um, so. Uh, Steve Nash, Julie Foudy, who's a soccer player, and Tony Hawk, um, skateboard dude. And it was actually kind of fun. I think they've had fun with it. They all use their, you know, social networks and um, their fan bases and all that stuff. But it's another example of trying to use technology in an innovative way to engage people in giving. And the last program that, and the, the biggest one that we're involved with um, is something that we've been spending a lot of time on. I know this is a Coca-Cola city. I apologize. Um, but the Pepsi Refresh Project, has anybody heard of this? A few people. Oh, pretty good, pretty good. OK, so let me just quickly show you their ad. Better music than our PSA, don't you think? <laughs> so for those of you who aren't familiar with this program, um, this is 
probably the largest um, crowdsourced giving program in the world. Uh, so what Pepsi's done is take $20 million this year, and as it describes there quickly, any idea, which can come from an individual, for-profit company, or a nonprofit that falls into one of those thematic categories, people submit, if you can get in, <laughs> um, and then there's a month of voting. And every month, 32 grants are selected based purely on the public vote. And it's been a really interesting exercise. It started in, in January. Um, global giving, once the winners of the vote are announced, we actually do all of the validation that the people who propose the idea are, who said they said they are, that they have a plan, that we understand where the money, how the money is going to be used, what the budget is, and we handle all the disbursement of the money for Pepsi. Um, so it's so far they've had over 50 million votes. Um, they've awarded about seven million dollars in grants uh, to about two, almost 200 organizations, and uh, it's been a really, really interesting exercise. And I think it has sparked a lot of interest in the sort of corporate social responsibility cause marketing kind of space. Lots of companies are coming to us and saying, we want a mini Pepsi refresh. Um, but I think the idea that um, brands will, are using their marketing money to try to engage their customers and invest in things that their customers actually care about rather than just bombarding them with funny commercials um, is something that you know could be a trend. It, could, it may end up not being a trend. Um, but it's certainly something that people are kind of playing around with now. And it is totally the reason why I love my job. Plus, we get good Pepsi swag. Um, so just a few lessons learned and where we're going next. I know we need to leave some time for a few questions. OK, online giving is not like buying a song on iTunes. It's kind of what I was saying about people don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I heard that song. I'm gonna... I have this great app on my iPhone called SoundHound. Anybody on an iPhone? SoundHound. You're listening to the radio in the car. It hears the song and immediately tells you what song it is. And if you want to buy it, it's like one click. It is totally awesome. OK, that is not how philanthropy works, right? People, usually people give because somebody they know asks them to. Or there's a disaster. But it's generally not, ah, I just think I care, so I'm going to give. So it's not that impulsive. Um, experimentation and iteration are key to survival. Um, we, just, we just keep trying different stuff. Uh, and you know, we're constantly changing the website, the way we're displaying things, how we communicate, um, trying new technologies like the text messaging thing. And I think for any entrepreneur, you have to be, you have to have the DNA to live like that. You have to be willing to think that, you know, plan A, 99% of the time, isn't going to pan out. So what's plan B and plan C and keep trying? Um, just because you have a big brand for a partner doesn't mean your program will succeed. John and I talked about this the very first time we met or on the phone, and I explained to him that we had this huge brand that we did a program for, and they paid us a bunch of money to build these, this website and they put no energy behind this cause marketing program. I mean, zero. Compared to the ones I showed you, Neutrogena and Pepsi, it was like, we really just want to have a vanity site that we can show people, like, hey, look, we're doing good things for clean water in developing countries. But they did nothing with it. From my perspective, I don't want to do business with them anymore. That doesn't help our mission of trying to get more funds out to, out to the ground. Social media is great for friending and fanning and still relatively crappy for giving. Uh, it's, you know, we get a lot of referrals from Twitter. We get a lot of referrals from Facebook, um, some blogs. But generally, again, people give when somebody, and there's a reason when somebody asks. And then, um, you know, as I mentioned before, it's more about blocking and tackling than throwing 40-yard completions. And then finally, where are we going? Um, Keep getting better at understanding our customers, and, our, and this is for any business. In our case, our customers are donors, they're companies, and they're social entrepreneurs. And so we need to be ever mindful of how we're serving each one of those. Um, embracing new technologies, as I talked about, and then improving how we evaluate. But not just how we evaluate, but how, 
how we communicate and how we can make it visible to anybody who wants information about what's happening out there on the ground, what's going on. So that's kind of where we are, our little short story. Happy to answer any questions. Oh, I see the guy right here with glasses, white shirt. OK. okay. Uh, Speak up, because you don't have a mic. How do you deal with uh, charities that may have negative unintended consequences, like for a developing program that might destroy uh, a piece of an ecosystem? <laughs> Did you write me a letter about Neutrogena? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think as, as I'm tap dancing up here about those sorts of programs. I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to think, like, you know, if you're, let's use one example that's, that's probably a good one, um, where we've had some controversy, St stoves. There are a lot of stove projects on global giving. So instead of people, um, you know, having to walk, particularly women, having to walk to get fuel for their stoves, which puts them in jeopardy of, of violent crime, et cetera, create more fuel efficient stoves. So they could have to do that less frequently. Um, and also stoves that are better vented. So for their health purposes, they're not inhaling as much. Well, some people think that a lot of those stoves are actually putting as much crap into the environment as the old fires they were using. So there's different views on that. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's like I was saying before, we think that everybody's sort of moving forward trying to do a positive thing. I can't think of a project we have that's like ruining a part of an ecosystem. Um, but if you find one on our website, you could email me and tell me. Uh, seriously, I, I, I can't think, I'm not, I mean, maybe you have an example. I'm just trying to think of like, I suppose it could be like housing, which is displacing the links. You know, I mean, which would be like, I, it's a really bad answer. I really can't think of an example. Well, yeah. Like no. Like no, we do not. Again, that's very, we're, we're vetting the organization for legitimacy, and then the project is pretty much up to the people in the, on the ground. And our assumption is that over time, through tools like what, we, what I showed you, if they're really having some destructive impact in their community, that will surface. About a, a project? Yeah, so oh, absolutely. Said, yeah. So we would even go further and probably write a blog post about it. How do we collect payment and get it to the right place? Yeah. Yep. So people pay us through, um, mostly through credit card, also PayPal, and we also do accept checks. There are a bunch of online donation engines that don't accept checks. We think that's kind of silly. Um, it doesn't take that much work. So let's say we have uh, 5,000 transactions in a week or a month or whatever. So literally they're coming into 700 projects. We have a system where we reconcile that against which projects. And then every month we disperse funds out to the projects unless they only have, if, unless they only have like $200 or less, in which case we hold it until they get to that point because it's not really that efficient to move small amounts of money. For US organizations that have US operations, we tend to write them checks. And then we wire funds overseas to all of the other organizations that are based overseas. Oh. You have, um, I guess, two parts. Um, one is the Do I need a pen? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my first question is, how do you deal with the financial incentives and stuff like that? Because uh -huh. it costs a lot of money to run servers, to hire IT guys, just to make sure global giving works. How do you guys do it? Yep. OK. So, our goal from the beginning has been to generate enough revenue on our own steam to not have to do foundation grant funding forever. We're not quite there. So right now, we're moving in that direction. This year, we'll cover about 75% of our costs through revenue. The revenue comes from two places. Every time somebody makes a donation, we retain 12 and a quarter percent. Um, sometimes less for some of these corporate deals, but basically we retain 12 and a quarter percent. Um, and then on all these corporate deals, we get paid for the services we're providing essentially. So if it's building a website or doing due diligence or 
running a campaign or whatever. So the combination of those two covers about 75%. We've been funded, um, not surprisingly, by um, private foundations that are run by former Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. So the founder of eBay, Pierre Omidyar, first president of eBay, Jeff Skoll, one of the founders of Yahoo, Dave Philo and his wife, they've been significant funders of ours because they kind of get this, these concepts. Um, and then a few other smaller private foundations. They hired me. <laughs> How did it get the momentum? Easy answer, actually. Asian tsunami. South Asian tsunami. That was the, unfortunately, that was the sort of catalyst for people finding us. They, like, just out of the woodwork, people found us. And, and companies found us. They would, like, Google and find us and call and say, Hi, we want to give $50,000 to a project in Thailand. Can you help us find one? Um, and that, we had literally been like bumping along for a few years, and then it was like, boom. And then it sort of, and then boom. But that was, that was when it, it kind of started. Um, has the concept of global giving ever faced some criticism? Yes. We've faced lots of criticism. Partially because of the 12 and a quarter percent, people think that's too much, um, and they're like, "Well, you're a nonprofit. How can you be keeping this money? And it's, it's overhead, and we hate overhead." Um, there, so that um, we feel like what we offer to the people raising funds on our site, as I just demonstrated, is pretty good, um, and we're trying to make it better. Um, that's one criticism. Another criticism is um, that we don't do that kind of deep evaluation before we post a project on the site. So, you know, just some of the, some of the questions, like how do you really know that this guy in, you know, Bangalore is legit? You don't really know until you have some experience with them. I mean, you do whatever you can to look at the documentation that they provide, et cetera. So that's, you know, there are some people who are sort of skeptical about that. Um, those are the two main things, I would say. My personally? Um, nah, I mean, there is a rat named Donna now. Um, but they have funny names, the rats, like Martin Luther King, um, Saddam Hussein, sort of. I, how those two get in the same cage, I don't know. But um, OK, so wait, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, turn down projects. Yeah, so as long as we can validate that the organization or who, you know, whatever's, whoever's doing the project is like a legitimate organization, um, we let them come on the site. We run these contests, sort of like the Athletes for Hope one, for every, unless you come through a corporate partner, you have to demonstrate that you actually get what global giving is and that you might be able to use it. So we run these challenges. So you have to raise $4,000 from at least 50 donors in a month in order to stay on the site. And that's that's the main way we weed people out, actually. Because if they can't mobilize that many people, it's like either they're not for real or, because it's, it's a lot easier to get people to vote for you than it is to pull, get them to pull out their wallets. So that's a little bit of the crowdfunding concept. Um, occasionally, we'll have a situation where the project, we, we, and this is where the, the open and transparent stuff works, where somebody posts a project and then someone posts on their project page, this is BS. This is not what's happening. And then we'll follow up and find out. And we've actually had two instances where we've taken projects down. And one in Kenya where we actually worked with the project leader who, it turns out, you know, wasn't doing anything wrong. He just was totally overextended. And so he, wasn't, he had too much going on. So we kind of actually brought in some resources from Kenya to help him organize his organization more, to be able to be more effective. Oh, we have time. Just one more oh, no. I didn't. I'll give you after the talk. Yeah, I'll be. I, I'll be around. I don't think my dinner date is here. Um, is anyone here from California? Do you have a question? Okay. Yes. 
I'm from California, so that's the only fair way to do it. Where are you from? Orange County, Orange County that's too bad, okay. How many employees? We have about 25 employees. And we have the most kick-ass interns ever. We have all the time like 10 interns. Um, some undergrad, lots of graduate students. There's a lot of international development programs in DC. You know, GW and AU, um, international business at Georgetown. So we get really, really awesome graduate interns. And we pay them. <laughs> Thank you.